Part 2, Missouri Irish, A History of the Irish in America by Michael C. O'Laughlin. Copyright 2010 from the Irish Roots Cafe and irishroots.com. Chapter 2, The First Irish Americans. The first Irish Americans, 1804 to 1821, prior to statehood. In a two-day period, March 9th and 10th, 1804, Upper Louisiana, which became the territory of Missouri in 1812, was successively under three flags, Spanish, French, and American. This reflected the early heritage of Missouri settlers. Irish Americans would now lead the development of this untamed land into statehood in 1821. St. Louis began in 1764 as a transfer point for French traders in New Orleans traveling the Mississippi. A major city west of St. Louis was not seriously considered for another 80 years. When Missouri was declared a state in 1821, Kansas City did not yet exist. Early reports told of a vast American desert west of St. Louis. Described as useless for any purpose, including farming, few souls rose to counteract this notion prior to 1810. The Irish American played a key role in developing the area after 1804 under American control. It is good that they did. How wrong the others were about the future breadbasket of the world. William Gilpin, who was in contact with Lincoln, Jackson, and Thomas Hart Benton, described the territory as the garden of the world in the mid-1800s. The real battle had taken place decades earlier as the state was just forming. Irish-born Joseph Charles campaigned for a change in Missouri's territorial status in 1808. His newspaper, The First West of the Mississippi, played a large role in the development of the frontier. Millionaire John Melanfi came to St. Louis prior to 1810 realizing the potential of the area. The years 1804 to 1821 show the Irish-American contributions to the land. They arise in social, economic, religious, and intellectual endeavors. By 1818, they had formed their own immigrant society, aiding others traveling to Western America. Americans were just beginning to pass through Missouri heading west or settling here from the south. The beginnings of the slavery issue arise, and the pioneering spirit becomes evident in St. Louis. Soon to become the fifth largest city in the nation, it would also hold the largest foreign-born population in America in 1860. Joseph Murphy, born in Ireland in 1805, arrived in St. Louis in 1818. His Murphy wagon came to provide the preferred method of travel in the West until the coming of the railroad. Still an unknown wagon maker in 1821, he helped shape the destiny of thousands of settlers. The Irish in St. Louis, when Murphy arrived as a boy, would make a major impact upon his future. From 1799 to 1820, Missouri grew from 6,000 to 20,000 in population. Considering the small number of residents, the contributions of the Irish American assume an even greater importance. Spreading the news. George Shannon came down the Ohio with Lewis in 1803 when no newspaper existed west of the Mississippi. The original Corps of Discovery composed of a handful of men would be formed at Clarksville. Shannon, the youngest to be recruited, would later become lost in Sioux country for over two weeks. He survived that escapade, but a later expedition would lead to a leg amputation in 1807. Shannon later helped publish the Lewis and Clark journals in Philadelphia, entered law, and served two terms in the Missouri legislature. In 1828, he settled in St. Charles, Missouri, becoming U.S. Attorney, State Senator, and Judge. He died in 1836 in Palmyra. Six years later, Shannon County, Missouri, was named in his honor. In 
Another early settler and Indian fighter, Robert Frazier, the wild Irishman of Franklin County, accompanied Lewis and Clark on their early expeditions, 1803 to 1804. These expeditions charted much of the western wilderness for the first time. In 1806, Captain Clark met two men by the name of McClellan while in Missouri. Of no relation to each other, the two Captain McClellans illustrate the number of Celtic surnames on the frontier. Other members of Lewis and Clark fame included Patrick Gass, the last surviving member of the expedition, and of Irish descent. William E. Bratton, of County Donegal heritage and born in Virginia, was a member of the group. Most of these men were Protestant Irish. Lewis and Clark passed through areas which became centers of trade. On the bluffs near Kansas City, they remarked that it was the perfect place for a fort. The Irish would level those bluffs in 1856 to 1860. Another Shannon would appear as mayor of the city in the 1860s and become a leading merchant in Kansas City. Pioneer Journalist The same year that George Shannon received his leg wound, Joseph Charles arrived in St. Louis. He ranks as one of the most important men in early Missouri. He published the first newspaper west of the Mississippi and the first book entitled The Laws of the Territory of Louisiana. Charles was an early campaigner for the statehood of Missouri. Joseph was the only son of Captain Edward Charles, whose paternal ancestor, John Charles, was born in Wales and emigrated to Ireland in 1663. Joseph was born in County Westmeath, Ireland, in 1772. Following the rebellion of 1795 in Ireland, he fled to France and then to New York in 1796. Missouri was still under the control of the Spanish regime, and the first group Irish settlement in the state was then taking place. Charles had gained a knowledge of the French language, and this would help him later in the former French trading post of St. Louis. Charles later traveled to Philadelphia and found employment with Matthew Carey, a noted publisher and friend of Benjamin Franklin. He worked as a compositor on William Duane's Aurora and set up for Carey the first folio edition of the Bible in the United States. His experience with Carey gave impetus to his belief in the role of journalism in the New World. He later traveled from Kentucky to St. Louis with his printing equipment on muleback. He went on to found the first newspaper west of the Mississippi in St. Louis. The paper made a major impact on the development of the West. In 1798, Charles married Sarah Jordan McLeod, a widow. Her three-year-old son soon had the company of Charles' son, Edward, born in Philadelphia in 1799. Both boys became active in the newspaper business in St. Louis. Joining in the spirit of Western migration, Charles settled in Lexington, Kentucky before arriving in St. Louis. In 1801, his second son, Jean, or John, who died in 1816, was born there. Charles was employed as a printer, publisher, and bookseller while in Kentucky. He began publication of the Louisville Gazette on November 24, 1807. Missouri had no newspaper at this time, and the town of St. Louis had not yet incorporated. Recognizing the future potential of St. Louis, Charles began his weekly paper, the Missouri Gazette and Advertiser. Among the goals of the paper, as stated by Charles, was to, quote, extinguish party animosities and foster a cordial union among the peoples on the basis of toleration and equal government. Unquote. He saw the need for Americans to work as one. On July 12, 1808, Charles published an 8 by 12 paper establishing a major form of communication in the West. In 1808, he was made the first official printer of the territory 
and printed the first book west of the Mississippi. In 1809, the city incorporated. In 1812, Missouri became a territory, and in 1821, a state. Charles campaigned hard for this development. In reply to the critics of the Louisiana Territory, he proclaimed, quote, We will become the bright star in the Federalist constellation, unquote. He vigorously opposed those who thought the territory was a vast wasteland. His voice played no small role in bringing the truth forward. In 1809, when the Missouri Territory was renamed the Louisiana Territory, the name of the paper changed to the Louisiana Gazette. The economy of the day did not always rely upon paper money. Charles publicly advertised that he would accept payment in the form of pork, flour, old copper, and brass. One had to be innovative to publish the first newspaper west of the Mississippi. Another notable accomplishment was his publication of the Missouri Almanac in 1818. It ran for many years. A growing area like St. Louis did not have one newspaper for long. Some opposed the public voice of Charles in the news. Many of these rivals were Irish, as was Charles. Irish Competitors in the News In 1814, a group in St. Louis took offense at some of Charles' publications and raised $1,000 to begin a rival paper, the Western Journal. These rivals included William C. Carr, who was appointed judge of the circuit court in St. Louis. Carr was to be succeeded by Judge Luke E. Lawless, an Irish gentleman from Dublin and well-known lawyer who fled to France prior to his arrival in America. Also included among Charles' opponents was Major William Christie, an Irishman from Pennsylvania arriving in St. Louis in 1804. In 1808, he mined for lead in Blackwater Township. Politically prominent in 1814, he was appointed Auditor of Accounts for the Territory. In 1820, President Monroe appointed him Register of the U.S. Land Office, a position he held until 1833. The Western Journal, however, did not prosper. In 1817, the name changed to the Western Emigrant, in 1819 to the St. Louis Inquirer, when Missouri Senator Thomas Hart Benton became its editor. It is not surprising that the Irish strove to keep an opposition voice open in the news. For political reasons of their own, and for the preservation of freedom, the result of censorship and repression were known only too well by the Irish. The St. Louis Recorder of Deeds Office documents Charles' signature as Justice of the Peace in 1815 involving the sale of land in St. Louis County between William Massey and Stephen Hancock. According to Scharf, Charles was elected president of the Mechanics Benevolent Society, organized on April 10, 1817. This was one year prior to the establishment of the Irish Immigrant and Corresponding Society in St. Louis. Charles became a member of that organization as well, although most of its members were Catholics. Charles, a Presbyterian, practiced his philosophy of unity among all Americans. The town was stronger for it. Mr. Charles retired after 12 years of publication. His valedictory to his patrons contained the following, quote, The paper was established when the population hardly numbered 12,000. The original subscription was but 170, now increased to 1,000, unquote. James Cummins published the paper for about 18 months, and Bernard Gilloli acted as his partner. He then sold out to Edward Charles, the son of the original publisher. In the 1840s, the paper was renamed the Missouri Republican and later the St. Louis Republic. In 1919, it was absorbed by the Globe Democrat. In 
These early papers can be reviewed at the State Historical Society of Missouri in Columbia. Upon retirement from the newspaper, Charles and his son, Joseph Jr., built up a substantial wholesale drug business. Continuing operation as the firm of Blow and Charles, they were responsible for the preeminence of St. Louis in the drug business. By the time of Charles' death, in 1834, the face of the nation had changed. Missouri had gone from being a possession to a territory to full statehood in 1821. The pioneers settling here in the first decades of the century had brought new generations of Americans into adulthood. Irish settlers grew to become the largest foreign-born element of the St. Louis population in 1820. Young men like Joseph Murphy arrived as children before statehood from Ireland and were now in business for themselves. The largest taxpayers in town included firms like that of McKnight and Brady in 1811. Charles, survived by his wife and two sons, was described by a family member as, quote, a noble specimen of the Irish gentleman impulsive warm-heartedness being his most characteristic trait. He was polite and hospitable, his countenance cheerful, his conversations sprightly and humorous." Unquote. Charles was a member of the First Presbyterian Church in St. Louis. One of his largest contributions was the patriotic support of Missouri's entry into the Union as a state. It was Charles who defended the Midwest against the Eastern political editors who referred to it as a big swamp. The truth was victorious in the end with the help of Irish-born Joseph Charles. The newspaper and journalistic fields were preferred by the Irish regardless of religious affiliation. No other single field of endeavor was used more influentially by the early Irish. The number of Irish publishers and journalists underscores a common drive among them, the desire to reach the population with a message. The following pages will highlight some of the Irish active in the news business in Missouri. Irish in the News A divisive issue in early Missouri was that of slavery. Most Missourians were of southern stock. The Spanish had actively sought settlers from Kentucky prior to 1804. The majority of the Southerners at the time of statehood came from Kentucky or Virginia. Slavery had been considered a legal institution in the South. Immigrants from abroad and those arriving from the northern states opposed slavery. Many immigrants were only too familiar with the specter of slavery themselves. Indeed, it was said that the Irish peasant was worse off than the Negro slave in America. The differing opinions of these recent settlers caused great conflict, culminating in the Civil War years later. Joseph Charles, editor of the Missouri Gazette, spoke against slavery. Charles came to America for political reasons involving the rebellion in Ireland and Robert Emmett. He came to St. Louis in 1807 influencing public opinion with his paper in 1808. The paper passed to James C. Cummins in 1820 and then to Edward Charles, son of the original publisher. In 1819, McHenry founded the St. Louis Inquirer, having arrived from Nashville. Bad blood ran between the two papers, which eventually led to an assault by McHenry upon Charles. In June of 1820, a stepson of Joseph Charles, Robert McLeod, began publication of the Missourian at St. Charles, Missouri. His motto was, Intelligence is the life of liberty. He was elected the first public printer by the state legislature. The Charles family had certainly made an impact on the early frontier through the newspaper business. They were the first of many Irishmen to follow in the field. The Irish in St. Louis continued the tradition. William McKee, born in New York of Irish parents, organized the Argus in 1842. 
In 1849, McKee and Associates, including Edward Walsh, merged the Argus and Signal newspapers. The new paper was launched as the first free soil newspaper in Missouri. The partnership continued until 1872, when McKee went on to organize the Globe, becoming the rival of the Democrat newspaper. Joseph B. McCullough, born in Dublin in 1842, became Washington correspondent of the Cincinnati Commercial and a Civil War correspondent. He arrived in St. Louis to edit the Democrat and in 1875 joined with McKee to form the Globe Democrat. As early as 1858, B. Doran Killian began the Western Banner, a newspaper in St. Louis discontinued around 1860. The Irish would become involved in many more publishing ventures in St. Louis in the coming years. The periodicals they were involved with included the American Celt, Home Press, The Sporting News, St. Louis Practical Photographer, Home Library and Hearthstone Visitor, and North St. Louis News. Late in the 1800s, William Reedy became editor of the St. Louis Sunday Mirror. Reedy, a product of the Kerry Patch, was the son of a police officer in St. Louis. The Patch, as it was known, had become the center of settlement for the new Irish that had arrived after the famine in 1845. That he rose so quickly out of the confines of the immigrant settlement is indicative of the rapid advancement of the famine immigrants throughout the land. Irish and Religious Publications The Irish in Religious Endeavors published newspapers and periodicals. Archbishop Kenrick was responsible for publishing The Shepherd of the Valley, the first religious publication of its kind. He also published the monthly magazine The Catholic Cabinet and the Catholic Newsletter. These publications were of wide influence. Father Phelan bought out the local newspaper in Adena, Missouri and renamed it the Western Watchman. Adena had been cited as the purest Irish settlement in the state. Prior to Father Phelan's purchase, however, the paper had been hostile to the Catholics. In St. Louis in 1856, we also found mention of the Reverend D. R. McAnally, a Methodist editor of the Christian Advocate. First in Kansas City and St. Joseph. Robert Vinton Kennedy began the first newspaper in Kansas City in 1851 when the area was still called the town of Kansas. Colonel Joseph A. Corby owned and published the St. Louis Gazette 1873 to 1875, as well as building the first telegraph exchange and electric plant in Buchanan County. James William Denver, an Irish-born newspaper editor in Missouri, was the man for whom Denver, Colorado is named. He was one of many who would move west from Missouri. First Printing Press in Illinois John Stuart McCracken was born in County Down, Ireland in 1816. Arriving in America at the age of seven, John and his four brothers learned the printing trade in Cincinnati. In 1838, he brought a printing press down the Ohio River to Shawneetown, Illinois. He owned land in Jefferson City, Missouri, and became the owner and publisher of the only newspaper in town, the State Capitol News. John's brother Frank left during the California Gold Rush, never to be heard from again. McCracken campaigned at some risk against slavery and was noted for his kindness towards foreigners, especially the Jewish immigrants. He won their lasting gratitude and friendship. A family Bible still extant in the mid-1800s traced the family back through two centuries to the stewards of Scotland. McCracken was the direct descendant of a Milesian chief who had settled in Ireland before the birth of Christ. Mrs. McCracken was responsible for making the first American flag to be carried into the city of Mexico in 
resulting from the Mexican Wars. The flag was distinctive. Having no supply of red silk, pink was substituted as a second choice. The pink, white, and blue waved proudly in the wind nonetheless. The Mexican War, Donovan and Kearney One of the big news stories of the day was the formation of the Army of the West, which marched on California and New Mexico. The whole contingent of men amounted to 1,650 soldiers, many of whom were Irish. The famine was beginning in Ireland at this time, and new immigrants were arriving in America regularly. All the volunteers were Missouri men commanded by Colonel Kearney from Missouri. Kearney was known as a strict disciplinarian, particularly to the volunteer ranks in his army. Captain Murphy commanded a battalion of infantry from counties Cole and Platte in Missouri. Another Murphy, by the name of Joseph, would benefit substantially from the war and its role in the opening of the West. By 1849, entire caravans heading west would be composed of Murphy wagons. The Army and early traders had used his wagons prior to the war. Colonel Donovan, a former private and lawyer from Clay County, also commanded. He eventually penetrated the entire Navajo country. Billy McCauley, likely of Howard County, was one of the enlisted men in Donovan's ranks. James McGoffin had been a merchant in Mexico for 20 years and acted as spy for Kearney during the campaign. Much has been written on the exploits of Kearney and Donovan for those who wish to pursue this phase of history. Alexander Donovan, originally the name was Don Iphen in Spain, came from a hamlet near Independence known as Liberty. He led the first regiment of Missouri volunteers to Mexico in the summer of 1846. At the age of eight, he had been placed with an eccentric but brilliant Irish educator, Richard Keane. Keane, a graduate of Trinity College in Dublin, trained and educated Donovan in Augusta, Kentucky. The education Donovan received from this Irishman apparently did him well. In several battles, Donovan was badly outnumbered, as in the Battle of El Brasito, but he emerged victorious. Upon arriving in New Orleans, his band of men had become a legend. They had marched over 2,000 miles, suffered but minor casualties, emerging victorious over larger forces. Two of the casualties were A. A. Kirkpatrick and J. S. Magruder, who died in Donovan's service, but were not native Missourians. General James Shields of Altamare County, Tyrone, Ireland, also fought in the Mexican War. Born May 12, 1806, he came as a youth to Illinois. The only man to have ever represented three states in the U.S. Senate, he served as strategist in the Shenandoah Campaign of the Civil War. He also holds the dubious distinction of challenging Abraham Lincoln to a duel before his Senate election in Illinois. Fortunately, the duel was settled by peaceful means. Shields settled at Carrollton, Missouri shortly after the war. He was a United States Senator from Missouri the Mormons, and other religious denominations. Donovan was involved with incidents concerning the Mormon Church in Missouri. A friend and advisor to them from the start, he was also their attorney. Declaring that the age of extermination was over and being called upon to execute Joseph Smith, he replied, quote, It is cold-blooded murder. I will not obey your order. If you execute these men, I will hold you responsible before an earthly tribunal, so help me God. Unquote. The Irish clergy are to be found in every denomination. Mormons of evident Celtic descent included, from the Quorum of Twelve, James W. Gillen, born 1836, Ireland, William H. Kelly, born 1841, Illinois, 
Patrick O'Banion was a young saint who died on October 5, 1838, the day of Bogart's attack upon the Mormons. Brother John Lowry lived in the swamp amid the low-timbered bottoms of the Missouri River, along with his family, in 1834. The bishop of the Church in Independence was Edmund L. Kelly, born 1844. Succeeded by Benjamin R. McGuire in 1916 and Albert Carmichael in 1925. On the other hand, we find the following clergymen who spoke against the Mormons. The Rev. M. Riley, Baptist, McCoy, Kavanaugh, and Fitzhugh. There was no lack of differing opinions among these Irish clerics in Missouri. An entire volume could be written on the Irish clergy in Missouri. The Irish Catholic priests alone could fill hundreds of pages. Father Maxwell arrived in the 1790s at the request of the Spanish regime for an Irish priest. Father Flynn was the first priest stationed in St. Louis in 1806. In 1798, the Murphy Settlement was established near Farmington. William Murphy was a Baptist preacher who came to Missouri from East Tennessee. His widow Sarah returned to Missouri in 1804 with her two sons, Isaac and Jesse, claiming the lands her husband had originally staked. Mrs. William Murphy taught one of the first Sunday school classes in the territory there in 1807. David Murphy had the honor of cutting the first tree in what was known as the Murphy Settlement. The Christian denomination was the first to settle in Lone Jack, Missouri. Among the first preachers were Elder Mulkey, Thomas McBride, and James McBride in the 1830s. The Thomas McKnight and Shawhan families were settled there in the 1830s as well. The first Methodist church west of the Mississippi was McKendry Chapel. From 1806, meetings were held there and the first congregation formed. Dennis Sullivan taught school in this settlement in Cape Girardeau. In 1855, the Reverend J. Hogan, a Methodist minister and Whig politician, spoke at the dedication of the first synagogue in St. Louis. Another Hogan, the Reverend J.J. J. Hogan, the Catholic Hogan, established the Irish Wilderness in 1858 in Oregon and Ripley counties. He went on to become the first bishop of the St. Joseph Diocese. Most often of the Catholic religion, the Irish played important roles in many faiths on the frontier. Men like Bishop Richard Kenrick brought more than the verbal word of God to the wilderness. They fostered an active communication and a spirit of cooperation between men. It is easy to see the Irish contribution in this field. In 1818, John and William Finney were trustees for the First Methodist House, house of Worship. They also developed a successful business in the steamboat trade. Steamboat Irish the steamboats were a vital link in communications and trade. Joseph Murphy's wagons carried people west by land. Other Irishmen would move the settlers up and down the Missouri and Mississippi. William and John Finney came from Ireland in 1818, making a fortune in St. Louis steamboat supplies. Living in the Finney mansion, they acquired real estate, wealth, and prominence in early Missouri. Among other projects, they built the Lindell Hotel, or helped to build it, as several Irishmen have laid claim to the building. James and William Patrick, Irish from Pennsylvania, built steamboats and established a lumber yard in St. Louis. Patrick Gorman of County Kilkenny was a nephew of the Walsh brothers. A popular steamboat captain, he also served as president of the Union Fire Company. Barton Abel, of paternal Irish heritage, was captain of the steamboat Ocean Wave. He served as a Missouri legislator in 1850 and as, and as president of the Merchants Exchange. The first man to cast a vote for the emancipation of Missouri in 
He was collector of internal revenue in St. Louis. The hands on deck during the famine were mostly Irish, according to O'Hanlon. These vessels provided a vital service along the rivers for both new immigrants and old settlers. Referred to as Fulton's Folly, the steamboat moved the West and the Irish into a new era. The Indian Wars The Indian Wars were of more than passing interest to the readers of the first St. Louis newspaper begun by Charles. Frontier life was unsettled and Missouri was not yet a state. The dangers here were not unlike those faced by American pioneers in the previous century. Men like Broken Hand Fitzpatrick and Kit Carson were trailblazers. Men like Fitzpatrick would loan their journals and maps to Lewis and Clark to aid them in their explorations. Indian raids were a fact of life. Matthew Kennedy had been killed around 1780 by attacking Indians in Missouri. Later residents would face the same hazards. To illustrate, we give the following account of a few families who had settled on Lutra Island by 1807. Lutra Island was in the Missouri River below Herman, Missouri. Captain James Calloway was killed by Indians at the nearby crossing of Prairie Fork on March 7, 1815. He came from the island commanding a group of men intent on recapturing horses that had been stolen from them by the Sac and Fox Indians. He was shot in the head by Indians and his lifeless body was left to float helplessly downstream. Two other members of the group, Frank McDermott and James McMullen, were killed when crossing the bank of a creek with the recaptured horses. They were cut to pieces and hung on trees as a warning to the others. At the beginning of the war, O'Neill was living on Kings Lake in Lincoln County. His family was massacred. In pursuit of the Indians later, a man identified as Ranger McNair killed one of the Indians responsible. The country was wild in the early 1800s as these stories relate. The pioneers had a price to pay for settling the new land. They deserve our recognition, just as those of earlier years. Hostilities of 1812 In the spring of 1812, hostilities were begun by the Indians. Forts were erected, and the settlers retired there with family and friend. They remained within the walls of the fort for three years. The people organized themselves into military companies. William McMahon was a first lieutenant. The number of men able to bear arms was 112. In addition to the forts listed in the following section, Fort McMahon was erected two miles below Arrow Rock on the south bank of the Missouri River. The following list shows all the men and boys of the forts. The number of Celtic surnames represents a large portion of the population. The Famine Irish An event that nearly all Irish Americans recognize is that of the Great Potato Famine. The years 1845 to 1852 are generally included in this period. The Irish were evicted from their homes, suffered starvation, and died of resultant disease. More Irish came to America as a result of this famine than at any other time in history. The event is well imprinted upon the minds of the Irish American. Countless family researchers have told me that their ancestors came over during the Great Famine. That, of course, is when the Irish came to America. Sometimes they are wrong. Research will show that the family arrived decades prior to or after the Great Famine. Missouri felt the impact of this famine immigration. Many came up the Mississippi with fever and cholera. In 1849, boats docking in St. Louis held people half alive on deck. Many of the deckhands and passengers were Irish. Arriving near St. Patrick's Church and Battle Row after docking, they likely settled in the Cary Patch, 
They were generally poverty-stricken immigrants who often brought disease into the city. This naturally evoked fear and hostility from the native population. Also present at that time was a movement against German and Irish Catholic immigrants who were arriving in such great numbers. Numerous riots broke out and an Irish organization was formed to assist the victims of the riots in 1854. Not all arrived in St. Louis by way of New Orleans and the Mississippi River. Many traveled overland by wagon from the east, and the Ohio River continued to be a major means of transportation. Some stayed less than a year before traveling on. Considering the conditions in the big cities where many had settled, it is no wonder that many left for the west. Conditions were not as bad as in the big cities back east, but they were bad enough. St. Louis had become one of the largest cities in the nation and could be considered eastern to many. Tenements, slums, and unsanitary living conditions were common to all of the cities. These areas were often all that was available to the new arrivals. The damp, crowded cellars and tenements seemed to be unbearable living conditions. To the Irish immigrant, they were an improvement. The Irish of the famine period felt lucky just to have a roof over their heads. Thousands wandered homeless, starving to death in Ireland. Here, there was hope. It was their new home. Joseph Murphy arrived in St. Louis at the age of 13 without home or family prior to 1820. At the time of the famine, he was doing well in the wagon trade. As the famine immigrants arrived in the Cary Patch in St. Louis, the news of gold strikes in California came. Many an immigrant would climb aboard a wagon and head west. This great migration of individual settlers led to hundreds of thousands of wagons moving over the western frontier. Murphy's Wagon Replaced Those who survived the famine continued to arrive in America. The railroad became a principal means of employment. The Irish became prominent in both management and labor. The life of the railroad worker was a physical and unsettled one, with little in the way of a traditional lifestyle. It was often the only means of employment available. Prior to the Civil War, slave labor in the city and on the farms left migratory rail work as the only alternative. The conditions of the railroad worker led the Reverend J.J. J. Hogan to establish the Irish Wilderness Settlement in southeast Missouri. The wilderness was a self-sufficient community with homes and a church and proper family living conditions. The path of the rail charts the course of Irish settlement in the West. When the rail was completed, or the time felt right, the workers could leave the railroad and settle in a nearby area, often a major rail city. Irish who did not work on the railroad traveled the railroad to their final destination, most often settling in cities that the railroad served and created. The Irish were an integral part of the American railroads. Kansas City became a major city due to the course of the railroad. More Irish settled here than in any city west of St. Louis in Missouri. St. Joseph the third largest in Irish population, was also an early rail center. The earlier Irish could work as small shopkeepers, farmers, and heavy laborers. Later, the slaughter and meatpacking industry in Kansas City and St. Joseph would provide a good source of employment. In St. Louis, the iron smelting industry employed many. The first group Irish settlement in Kansas City was brought about in order to level the bluffs of the city in 1856. Irish Railroad Management That the Irish performed the heavy labor for the railroads is well known. Their role in management, ownership, and promotion is often overlooked. The town of O'Fallon, Missouri, bears the name of the man who brought the railroad there. 
The O'Fallons had arrived prior to statehood and were prominent in the railroad industry and elsewhere. John O'Fallon subscribed $100,000 in capital stock for the railroad in 1850. John Scott of Roscommon arrived in 1855. He was a major force in the building of the Northern Pacific and Iron Mountain Railroad lines. It was said that he provided employment to more people than anyone else in the state. County Roscommon was also the birthplace of Thomas Donnelly and Edward Dowling. They founded a successful railroad construction firm which lasted for 30 years. John G. Kelly of Dublin worked for the Missouri Pacific, as Scott did. He planned the construction of the Iron Mountain Line from St. Louis. Julius Walsh, the eldest son of Edward Walsh, became president of a concern that controlled 22 of the railroad lines entering St. Louis. A lawyer, he was also president of other concerns. Prominent men like Gamble, Walsh, Crow, McGonigal, O'Fallon, and Scott supported the rail's westward expansion. Wayne Crow was an organizer of the Missouri and Pacific Railroad. Men like Hugh O'Neill were prominent railroad supporters in the state legislature. It becomes apparent that the Irish played an important role in all phases of railroad development, not just the laying of track. The Civil War a landmark decision of the Supreme Court involving the rights of men was the Dred Scott case, 1846. Arising in St. Louis, many believe this decision was the precipitating cause of the Civil War. Alexander Hamilton, an active Scots-Irish lawyer, sat as judge on the Dred Scott decision, returning the first verdict to be overturned by the Supreme Court. Hamilton was one of the founders of the St. Louis Law Library. Roger B. Taney, of Irish heritage, was sitting on the U.S. Supreme Court, which overturned Hamilton's decision. The Dred Scott question arose in America while the famine was raging in Ireland. Of the Irish and German immigrants arriving in America, most were pro-Union in their sympathies. The war would interrupt Missouri's development violently as the state became divided. The Irish wilderness was overrun and destroyed by the war. Areas like Kansas City would grow tremendously after the war, attracting large Irish populations. Slavery Slavery was an accepted institution for many in Missouri. The old French slavery code had worked to protect the slave rather than strengthen the institution of slavery. Under that code, families could not be broken up for sale, and extreme punishment was forbidden. Sundays and holidays were days of rest for all, and slaves were instructed in religion and baptized. However deplorable it is now, slavery was a fact of life. Some early Irish settlers owned slaves. From the records of St. Louis Cathedral, we find that, quote, On the 30th of October, 1836, I baptized William Henry, six weeks old, and John, six years old, both slaves belonging to Mr. H. O'Neill, born of Mary, likewise slave, belonging to Mr. O'Neill, unquote. The sponsors were Henry Gibbord and Mary O'Neill. In Howard County, William Swinney paid taxes on 86 slaves valued at $44,800 plus 1,369 acres of land prior to 1860. In Clay County, John Doherty was located on the Rich River Bottoms. His assets in 1858 included 2,420 acres of land and 33 Negroes. These large landowners would have had some Southern sympathy. Their way of life was dependent upon slaves. In 
The new Irish and German immigrants had just obtained a form of freedom themselves and were not about to support slavery. They had been too close to that themselves. While in the seminary, the Reverend J.J. J. Hogan completed a paper on the liberty and freedom of man. Ahead of the times, he opposed slavery. His instructors said little about the paper, but cautioned Hogan not to speak out or he would likely be lynched. Hogan went on to found the Irish wilderness and became the Bishop of Kansas City and St. Joseph. He would, in Kansas City, become good friends with Father Bernard Donnelly, the builder of the streets of the city. No detail of the Irish in the Civil War will be given here, although much is to be said for the Irish involved. The role of the Irish in the Civil War helped to merge the new Irish immigrants into the melting pot of America. After having fought in the Civil War, the general acceptance of the Irishmen in America was increased. They had become Americans by trial of blood. Irish units were common. Colonel James A. Mulligan led a regiment bearing the Harp and Shamrock flag against Confederate forces at Lexington, Missouri, although they were badly outnumbered by some 12,000 men. St. Louis and the Civil War Irish In 1861, Dennis Sheehan, the king of the Cary Patch, was imprisoned at McDowell Medical College. That same year, a large meeting was held in support of the Union. The president of the group was Robert Campbell. The vice presidents included John O'Fallon, William Patrick, John Hogan, and Daniel Donovan. Judging by a number of prominent Irish at the forefront, their following must have been sizable. The pro-Southern Governor Claiborne Jackson was replaced by Hamilton Rowan Gamble, an able lawyer of Irish ancestry. Thomas O'Reilly was appointed provost marshal and examined applications for the reopening of businesses. Lawyer David Murphy raised the first body of troops from the interior of Missouri to reach St. Louis. The medical profession had its share of Irish during the Civil War. Paul Robinson, a Scots-Irishman, was the first medical officer in the country to join the Confederates. He would make his home in St. Louis. Dr. Florence M. Cornyn became a surgeon of General Blair's regiment. Dr. Charles Hughes, the son of an Irish immigrant, served at the U.S. Marine Hospital and was a St. Louis physician. All Irish companies were formed. The Emmett and Montgomery Guards were all Irish. The Washington Guards were mainly so. The Irish enlistment in the Confederate forces was considerably less than the Union, but notable just the same. Not all the Irish were involved in the destruction of the war. Bishop Richard Kenrick sheltered many from both sides. His House of the Guardian Angels for Orphans was well used in caring for the injured. Father Ryan, chaplain of the Gratio Street Prison, comforted many as well. Moving into this period of more recent history, the story of the Irish in Missouri is more readily accessible to the inquisitive. As is the case in tragic wars such as this, many Irish would go to their graves fighting for a cause. In 1861, Private William C. Dowdy, an outspoken redhead from Tennessee, was sentenced to execution shortly after passing by St. Louis as an example to the galvanized Yankees. End of Part 2. Continue on with Part 3 of Missouri Irish. Copyright 2010 from the Irish Roots Cafe and irishroots.com.